Hi, today let's talk about the four pillars of object-oriented programming, which I will also refer to simply as OOP. I've been asked to explain the four pillars of OOP many times during my tech interviews with different companies ranging from startups to FANG and Fortune 500. If you haven't already, please check out my other videos in the Interview Fundamentals series. These videos are supposed to help you prepare for your technical interviews. Let's jump into the main topic. Let's start quickly by defining what OOP is. It is an approach to software development that uses objects that consist of attributes and methods. The four pillars of object-oriented programming allow developers to manage software complexity by organizing code into objects and allowing them to interact in a structured fashion. The four pillars of OOP are abstraction, inheritance, polymorphism, and encapsulation. Let's start by looking at what abstraction consists of. Abstraction consists in only showing the necessary details to the user of the object. Let's take a coffee machine as an example. When in the morning you press the button make coffee on your espresso machine, you don't need to know what is going on in the background. What you care about is that your coffee is going to get delivered. Let's look at a code example. Let's create a class that is called vehicle. And let's add a method called start engine. And what we want this method to do is simply print out engine started. And now if you go to our main, I want to create an instance of this object. Now that we have the instance, I want to call this method start engine. And if we run this program, we can see that engine start gets printed. So what I really wanted to show you is that I just called the method start engine as a user of this object. I don't care what's actually happening in here. There could be multiple steps in here, but what we care about is that when we call start engine, the engine gets started. Inheritance is a powerful concept that allows the reuse of code. It's helpful when you want to build a class on top of an existing one in order to reuse methods and attributes in the mother class. Classes which are derived from an existing class are called subclasses or extended classes. Let's look at how this looks like in code. So right now we have a class called vehicle, but let's say we want a more specific class such as car. So let's go on and create this new class called car. And what we want this car class to do is to extend vehicle class. So now we have a subclass car from vehicle. And if we go to our main and we actually comment this out and we create a object called car, We can see that when we try to call start engine, what's going to happen is this method is inherited from the parent class. So we can call this method in car. And as you can see, this helps us to reuse code. So let's say in my vehicle class, I wanted to add another method that is common to all vehicles. So let's say, let's say stop engine. Now, if you go back to our main, even though our car class looks like this, where we simply extend vehicle class, we can go back here and call stop engine. And this method is going to get called. So this is the power of inheritance. Polymorphism is another pillar of OOP. People get intimidated by the name, but it is quite simple. 
It simply allows developers to create multiple methods with the same name but with different implementations. If you have used inheritance correctly, you can also reliably use parent classes as if they were like their children. In a few words, it means that an object can assume multiple forms. This will be clearer looking at some code. I'll create a new class that extends vehicle and I'll call this truck. So truck is a kind of vehicle, so I'm just going to extend from vehicle so that you can have these methods from vehicle. But let's say I want truck to have a different kind of engine start. So what we can do is we can actually override the method from the parent class. So we're going to override start engine. And what we want this to say is truck engine started. Let's do something similar in car. So let's override start engine here as well. And let's modify the system.out. So if you go back here and now we create a car and let's create a truck as well. If you do car.startEngine and truck.startEngine, what is going to happen is that the respective overridden methods are going to get called. Actually, polymorphism is more powerful than this. So let me show you another example. Let's say I had the object vehicle, but this vehicle is equal to a car. And that's possible because vehicle is a parent class. So a vehicle can be a car. It can also be a truck. But in this case, let's have vehicle as a car. And let's say we want to start engine. So what do you think is going to get called? The vehicle start engine or the car start engine? So let's, let's run this program and see what happens. As you can see, what happens is the car method that gets called and that's the power of polymorphism we can actually do also something else so let's have an array of vehicles uh, we actually need the truck and the car let's say now we go through each element of this simple array and we call the start engine let's see what happens as you can see, even though this is a array of type vehicle, but it has different elements. When we call start engine, what happens during polymorphism is that during runtime, JVM knows which method to call. In this case, it's calling the overridden methods. The concept of encapsulation is built on the idea of data hiding. With encapsulation, we restrict access of certain properties or methods of our object to only allow what is needed by the user of the class. Encapsulation is achieved by making things private. This means that the object itself will have control on its own state, and external classes will need to use setter and getter methods to change the state of the object. Let's see this using code. Let me get rid of this code, which we don't really need anymore. So let's go back to our car class and let's add an attribute. So I'm going to add speed and let's say we use an integer to represent speed. Now, if you go back to our main class and I do car dot speed, let's say we set the speed to 50. And now let's print out the speed of the car. As you can see, as a user, I have really easy access to the attribute of this object car, but this is bad practice. What you want to do is actually hide these attributes away from the user. In order to do that, what we can do is we can make this attribute private. And if you go back to main, you can now see that this is giving an error because a speed has private access. So the way we want to access these attributes of an object is by having a setter and a getter and this is how they look like so these are methods within 
the car class which are going to set the speed and get the speed attribute. So if we go back here, instead of doing car.speed, we're gonna do dot set speed and set it to 50. And here when we want to get it, we're gonna do car.get speed. And this is gonna have the same result as we just saw. So this way, as you can see, we are hiding the attributes. We don't give direct access to users. Uh, this helps to write safer code as well. To conclude, let's look at the benefits of the four pillars of object-oriented programming. Abstraction. It helps to reduce complexity. Inheritance. Helps to eliminate redundant code. Polymorphism allows more maintainable and readable code. And in the end, encapsulation, it prevents misuse of object data and methods, and it reduces complexity. If you have any comments or suggestions, leave them in the comment box below. If you found this video useful, please like and subscribe. Also check out my YouTube channel, you're gonna find many more lead code questions and other videos that I hope you're gonna find useful to prepare for your technical interviews. Thank you.